Hey, I'm Jonathan. I'm Ashley. And we're Tiny Shiny Home. We're a family of six building our off-grid desert homestead from the ground up. That's right. We're focused on natural and sustainable building methods and doing everything as naturally as we can. Today, we're going to be showing you our long-term permaculture plan for this property, as well as our detailed site plan. Very exciting. But before we get started, what exactly is permaculture? Wikipedia says that the definition of permaculture is an approach to land management that adopts arrangements observed in flourishing natural ecosystems. It includes a set of design principles derived using whole systems thinking. It uses these principles and feeds such as regenerative. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Don't I can't figure out are these words so dumb sound? <laughs> regenerative agri <laughs> regenerative <laughs> Regenerative agriculture, rewilding, and community resilience. What? Um, if you had trouble understanding that, that's okay, because we did too. Lots of words, no real meaning. Guys, let's talk about what permaculture means to us here in the desert. First up is water. We need to catch, store, and divert as much water as possible. We need to plant wind and firebreak trees because we have extreme weather and fire events here. We also need to create ponds and irrigation. We want to build an oasis in the desert. We want to design our property for maximum efficiency, but also we want it to be beautiful and we want to give back to the land instead of taking away from it. This leads us to Rudy Poe. He's our local permaculture designer here in Cochise County, and he's helping us wrangle all of our ideas into a cohesive plan for this homestead. We're going to spend some time with Rudy today. He's going to explain a lot of these permaculture concepts in detail, how berms and swales work, and he's going to share specifically our property design for our long-term plans. So without further ado, Rudy Poe. I'm Rudy Poe and I'm a permaculture designer. One of the things that inspires me tremendously about permaculture is this concept that we can relate to nature in a form that it's power with versus power over nature. And when we start to acknowledge and look at nature in a power with perspective, we can start to observe its patterns, we can start to observe how energy flows, and we can start to utilize systems that help us harness those energies to help us live as humans. So that's the specific reason um, why it inspires me because we have the ability to be able to live on our lands forever. When I say forever, I'm talking about being able to stay on our lands, increasing the abundance, increasing the amount of organic matter in the soil, which translates directly into foods. Things that we use and build with, we can design our system here so that all of the energy stays and grows more abundance. A big part of my journey has been working with and uh, learning from some of the local greats. Brad Lancaster was a huge inspiration for me. He's a Tucson native who really pioneered the rainwater harvesting and has made a lot of significant shifts in my hometown of Tucson, Arizona. The uh, other big um, giants in my mind was Bill Mollison, who is the father of permaculture. And then also I studied directly with the modern day father of permaculture, who is Jeff Lawton, who, if you haven't seen it, has uh, a wonderful video called Greening the Desert and really just shows how we can transform even a, a desert or a desertified landscape and bring it back to a state of thriving abundance that can produce food, shade, and shelter for life. So my goal, my mission is to help others to really essentially heal these lands in such a way where we can harness the energy of sake, for example, water and the sun and wind even to aid us in living 
that way we as humans can live and increase abundance versus overdrawing the, the natural capacity of the natural systems. One of the first things we're working on here with the Tiny Shiny Homestead is berms and swales. We're gonna talk about water, right? Because water is a big deal in the desert. Everybody always asks us, why don't you just drill a well? Unfortunately, in this particular area, there's an issue with sort of big agriculture, some dairy farms that are pulling down the water table. And so existing wells are starting to dry up. So for us, it doesn't feel like it's a good investment because wells are really expensive out here. You have, especially like where we are, we probably have to go down six, 700 feet at least to hit water. So we're looking to rainwater catchment as an alternative. It's also expensive, but it's not necessarily dictated by what other people are doing. There's obviously roof rainwater catchment, which is what most people do. We don't have a lot of roofs out here yet. We will eventually have some, but what we're gonna talk about right now are berms and swales. Berms and swales actually pull from sort of the ancient wisdom of our elders, essentially. Um, even if you look at more recently, um, back in the 1930s during the Great Depression, Roosevelt created these work organizations, once called the Civil Conservation Corps. Yeah, the CCC. And, yeah, yeah, the CCC and the Work Progress Administration, the WPA. But through them, they actually focused in on doing rainwater harvesting. And I don't think at that time they were necessarily like, you know, it's not like a movement like the way it is now. You can think of them as a way to you can think of them as a way to harness and capture the flow and the energy of water as water flows down a landscape. If there's nothing to stop it, it'll eventually congregate and concentrate down small drainage ways, eventually into washes and eventually to larger washes and eventually to large rivers like, for example, the Colorado River, which <laughs> drains to what is called source energy or the source, which is the ocean. But all the points in between there, the easiest and the simplest time to capture all that energy is at the top when it first falls on the ground and it starts to sheet flow across the landscape, Right. which is what we have here. We have a really terrific opportunity considering the landscape that we have here, where we have in general, a pretty flat landscape that is pitched downward. And with all that water, um, it will flow, it will fall on the ground and gently sheet flow uh, down the landscape. And the good news is just looking at what's here, we've got a ton of grass. And this is always a wonderful thing to see on any property because a ton of grass means there's something holding that soil in. So then as it fingers its way downhill, what we can do is we could create a capture and the capture is literally a swale depression in the ground so that if this is uphill, it will flow down this way and we can stop it right there and allow it to infiltrate into the ground. So let's talk about like the basic mechanics of a Berman swale because some people may not know what that even means or what it looks like. There's a lot of different swales out there and a swale is basically a depression, a long linear depression in the ground that we install on contour. And that's the important part about it is it's on contour, which is perpendicular to the flow of water. So if water's flowing downhill, we stop it with a perpendicular swale, which is a depression in the ground that um, and hold the water. Right, so all of our water is gonna be flowing this way towards you. Yeah. And then we're gonna be putting berms and swells across this way so the water runs into it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, one way to increase the holding capacity of a swell is to create a simple berm, which is as you excavate that swell, as you remove soil, you're taking that excess soil and you're putting it on the downhill side of that swale right. to build a raised area where you can plant plants and trees right. and also the, one of the main functions of it is really to increase the capacity 
right. of that swale so it can hold more water. The berms serve a wonderful place to plant plants because um, they're relatively higher and drier and then allows the roots to go down as deep as they need towards where the water is captured. The other huge benefit with it is that we are creating a capture not only for water but for everything, for organic matter, for materials, for animals, for you know things to decay and because of the relative moisture is higher in those areas we're gonna have more decay which translates directly into more organic matter the increasing of organic matter translates into more abundance you can grow especially here in the desert right absolutely <laughs> especially here in the desert so yeah and that's the, and that's the biggest um challenge we have living in desert climates is stopping these torrential flows to stopping them and use stopping it. torrential yeah. winds even because winds are wonderful for they deposit uh, nutrients from afar there's a lot of benefits to slowing winds down because it helps deposits of organic matters of nutrients of minerals to go back into the, the soil and the best part about it is it deposits all of that on the surface right. so that it can trickle down and get more access to underground roots, to underground microorganisms. It's all food for life right there. Yeah. We're using, we're capturing water and it's not like it goes on the ground and it goes to the aquifer and then we use it, but there's actually so many more other benefits to that in the sense that right. we're using the ground as a battery storage and um, the way these natural processes work is as we build the organic matter in the soil, we actually increase the capacity of that soil to hold more water. So, um, for example, for every 1% of organic matter that we increase per acre of soil, we increase the water holding capacity of that soil by on the order of eight to 10,000 gallons of water. It makes a huge difference when we do these things, when yeah. we can make those changes and those shifts to increase organic matter. And then everything else benefits from that. Your fruit trees that you plant close to that area, the windbreak species you plant close to, the, close to that area, become more resilient. They have better access to nutrients. We they, don't have to water them as often. You don't have to water them yeah. as often, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So besides actually like, you know, recharging the aquifers and like putting, like increasing our battery storage in the ground, the other practical benefit is that we can actually capture and store this water runoff to use for later too. So it's not all going in the ground. So let's talk about that and how on our particular property, like we've designed a few, like a swimming pond and like a storage pond, and then like how big they are and how that those numbers actually work in terms of like how long it'll take to fill them up and how many gallons we're able to produce just from rains. Cause it's crazy. With the rainwater harvesting plan for the tiny shiny homestead, um, we're going at it from multiple aspects of types of storage. And what I mean by that is we're starting first and foremost with what is readily available when it rains. And we can do this in two ways. We can do it passively or actively. And active refers to water tanks, you know, above ground storage systems, which tend to be expensive. Right, and, you guys are experiencing. Yeah, and we will be doing that, especially for the rain, like the roof catchment, we'll mm -hmm. be putting that into like storage tanks and then pumping it around the property. Yeah. But we're also going to supplement with ponds. Yeah. And that's, and that's the other, the, sort of the multi-faceted approach that we're taking here is we're going to also harvest the rainwater that flows on the land, utilize it for the most beneficial use. So um, one, we're storing the water in the ground. Yes, and then two, we're also going to be storing it in a system and a network of, of ponds. We're actually pulling from what our great-grandparents did in this very valley. And you can actually see remnants of these. Um, there's remnants of this on my property where they dug and harvested water um, into large ponds that they burned up uh, across uh, washes drainage ways. They knew what they were doing back then. Yeah. During the times of year when that pond would fill up, they would utilize that water 
to irrigate crops, to water cattle. And that's just how they did it back then because it was probably the lowest cost option available at that time. Sure, yeah. To be in tune with the rhythms of nature. And so that's what we're gonna be doing here at this very property is capturing that water. That sheet flows down from this direction and flows this way. And we're gonna have this on contour swale across the entire land, uh, landscape here mm -hmm. that will capture all that water. And once it all fills up that one swale, it will overfill into a pond that's on the same line of the contour swales as right. well. And I should say the property that our house is on, this parcel is six acres. So what we're talking about here in terms of, of water storage is only six acres. And there is a, another smaller parcel that's up ahead of us. It's an acre and a half that we can also include in those calculations because nobody's doing anything with it. These are gonna dictate, like you said, where the swimming pond goes, where the other pond goes, but also where our buildings and our houses and our animal animal pens and all that, like this is, this is like the basic infrastructure for the whole property. So it's really important that we start to get these in place so that we can start to do other things. In where we live, we, what's a general pattern of our climate, of our environment, is that we get these monsoon rains. Yes, and we do. <laughs> it's not uncommon for and one of those rains to get one or two um, large two inch rain events. And we're talking about within a 24 hour period, about two inches of rain falling in that period. And so when you put the numbers together, it's close to 350,000 gallons of rain just falling on this six acres. Because we get such big rain events, that means there's a higher potential for runoff. Right, because it can't soak in that fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it can't soak in that. And then the, there will come a point when the soil becomes super saturated. And at that point, that's what runs off. Okay. So during a two-inch rain event, you're saying that in our berms and swales and ponds, we could capture 250,000 gallons. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's, when we think about those numbers, that's what we're sizing our swales for. We're sizing our swales to capture 250,000 gallons right. over the landscape. The depth of the swale and like the width of it, mm -hmm. that's all sized based on our water calculations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we moved on to our 11 acres, we decided to only fence in six. And even on that six acres, the decision of where to put things was completely overwhelming. So that's when we called Rudy. We were like, help us design where our house goes, where our animals should go, how we're gonna store water and all the things. So we have our plan here that Rudy has helped us decide on. So we're gonna go over what all this means. So do you wanna talk about why we chose to put things in certain areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the most important things that you can, just even looking at this, is you'll start to see some structure naturally arise that was formed by water, mm -hmm. the energy of water. And when we take into context, like we want to capture water, we want to make sure that we capture most of the flow of water, most of the rainfall that falls into the site, and most of the stuff that flows into the site. It created this natural pattern that you see on the site. And that's the first structures you start to see here is the natural patterning of your landscape. Mm -hmm. So you start to see things naturally develop there. Like, oh, there's a great spot for a building. Cause it's, when I think about a building, we're trying to think about what is the safest place to put it, free from getting flooded, free from, um, also protected the most from wind and also the sun. Zones is this idea of looking at how do we as humans interact and relate to our environment. And there's this concept that's really important. It's called the lazy man's garden, mm -hmm. sort of the lazy man's home. And so a great way to illustrate this is say, for example, you have your home at a certain point on the property, and then you have your vegetable garden like 200 feet over this way, and you see it naturally maybe every other day versus if you place the garden close to where you walk every day to go to the car for example or you have a fruit tree on the way to where you visit your car or to get into your car 
you get to set our eyes onto that element, to that garden, to that orchard or whatever daily. Mm -hmm. And so that's what informed where we started. I started to place your elements here. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are energy intensive. For example, a vegetable garden is very energy intensive. You'll yeah. probably be going there once a day at least. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's energy intensive are chickens. You're probably going to be harvesting eggs every day. So you better bet that when we zone things, we're going to put the energy intensive things close to where humans reside. And the less need and care that the element needs, for example, cattle don't need to be seen every single day. You can start to push those things out towards the periphery. When we look at your property, you'll see these concentrated zones of intensive human and energy intensive uh, aspects. Like, for example, the vegetable gardens, the the living systems, the intensive watering systems, the energy systems like solar power are all kind of concentrated in sort of the sort of the core center of your whole property. Mm -hmm. And then as you build your way out from there, we get into the less intensive things. For example, pastures, yeah. little paddocks for your goats. Mm -hmm. As you walk to the chickens, you have other interactions. For example, I love how you guys designed your property here because as you walk from from your house to this chicken coop, you're walking past your kid's village, mm -hmm. all the kids. Mm -hmm. So you can check in with all the kids by virtue of just checking on the chickens. Yep. Or by virtue of checking on your kids, you're going to check on the chickens. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to double up all these different energy energies so that you guys have the most efficient flow. And then also it creates the most sort of vibrancy in your life. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a lifestyle of community, family interaction, and that you want to walk past your kids every day and see them every day. Yes, I do. And um, <laughs> you also want to see your chickens every day. That's where we start to stack compatible functions to create energy efficient systems that aren't just efficient, but they're effective. Mm -hmm. They're effective at building relationships to people and things mm -hmm. and animals. Yeah. So, that's, that's, that's beautiful. That's good. <laughs> <laughs>
that's the time where all the fields are being recovered mm -hmm. for the next season, yeah. for the next phase. And then also here, they just get fed whatever you might be growing or feed from other sources. But that's how you can have animals sustainably on small acreage. You know, you're still going to have to get the outside feed. So you can um, start to dial that down and tune it based on your area. And the good news with your area is you got lots of grass. So you got lots of good grass that, um, you know, over time, once you build the organic matter into the soil, the grass stands will get denser and richer, mm -hmm. more abundant, which means less food that you have to actually import. This is sort of the new wave that we're on yeah. in the modern days, which I'm really excited about, is to see us be able to utilize a creature that we've kind of demonized as being the culprits of global warming and overgrazing and all that, and start to utilize them as how nature intended and designed it to be. Before we go, let's talk more about windbreaks. <laughs> because hey, wind is a big deal out here. It really is. We've seen it cause all sorts of destruction. It, it can be a real problem if you're not prepared for it. And so like we mentioned earlier, these berms and swales, if we plant the right types of trees along those berms, then we can help protect the things that we're building out here. First step with the windbreaks is getting the general property boundaries or established in terms of protection. Yeah. Anything with inside the, the protected zone of the windbreak will have a relative higher humidity. Really? Yep. Okay. We'll also have a, um, less wind, which means more established concentration of organic matter and material. Right, because it's, it's not, not getting blown it's away. It's not getting blown away. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the most important aspect is deciding and placing your windbreaks so it actually protects the areas that you want to protect. Right. And what's worth protecting is anything you're growing, um, things that consume energy, like houses, because, you know, if your house is getting blasted with high winds all the time, that's reducing the thermal efficiency of your home. Right. So we're yeah. protecting the house, too. The windbreak species that we want to choose at this point would be things that can withstand the wind. And a lot mm. of the plants, like the pines, a lot of pines do really well. Right. With winds. Yeah, which you, you don't think about pines a lot in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, but it does help that we're high desert though, right? Yeah. Uh, if we were like lower, would that still be an option? Uh, no, lower, uh, mesquites in our climate, mesquites are always a great option yeah. because they're so dense, they're so thick, and they also double up as a food native food source. We're high enough that we can do pine based, which fill in even better than a mesquite, right? Well, they give you more protection in the sense that they're taller. True. Um, yeah. So yeah. the taller the windbreak, the more zone of protection behind it. With this windbreak system here, we're creating a system of a zone of protection to support life. And that directly translates into less maintenance, less upkeep. And also privacy too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can use these as privacy screens in yeah. addition to windbreaks. One other thing we didn't talk about earlier was firewood. Oh yeah. So you can also use the berms and swales to generate more tree and especially as they fill in like you were telling me about the idea of sort of leaving space between those trees and growing up a smaller tree in between the big ones and to help fill it in quicker but then once the bigger ones fill in then you can cut down that little one and you can chop it up and use it as firewood absolutely yeah. we have for example on this plant a 600 foot long swale that's a lot of digging guys <laughs> <laughs> if we uh, closely spaced these trees say at 15 feet on centers and say for example we did something like a um, Arizona cypress mm -hmm. which will easily get 20 25 feet wide we're looking at every other tree you can take out as they fill in right so we're talking about up to or it's to about 40 trees just on this one swale mm -hmm. with in the future timeline 20 full trees that, that you're going to be able to could be harvest firewood. for firewood yeah. <laughs> And one tree will probably get you through a whole season. So right. we're talking about multiple yeah. seasons of firewood yeah. available for for harvest yeah. right here. So it's like it all works together or something. It's weird. <laughs> a really big point about any of this design work that we're doing mm -hmm. is we're beginning with the end in mind.
So man, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, not only for like designing this because it's been a huge weight lifted off our brains of like, because decision fatigue is a real thing when you're building raw land from scratch. I mean, you can put anything anywhere you want and it just becomes too much. So thank you so much for helping us focus and figure out what we needed to do. Um, and thank you so much for coming on here and like sharing all this information because if you live off grid, if you're trying to build something like this from scratch, like these concepts are huge. It's the it's sort of the new way of doing things. It's the way everything is going. And we just really want to help shine a light on this whole permaculture thing because it's going to change the way that we can live off grid. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. And yeah, I really appreciate um, your guys' vision and effort. You guys brought me in at the perfect time in the sense that um, oftentimes I'll get onto a site where we've already got houses and oh, there's all too sorts, many things, too many things yeah, going yeah. on already. And that makes the design a little harder, but still completely possible. Sure. But you, you brought it in a time where we can actually make some very big critical decisions early on. Yeah. And that way you can know, you know, into the future that your, your house is placed for a very good reason. Exactly. We've got yeah. multiple reasons why the house is there uh, from energy efficiency to windbreaks to yeah. Um, protection to view sheds to all these things yeah. and so when we could take all that and look at it in the planning stage you can step forward with that security and assurance knowing like ah oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's there because of that yeah and you you know why that foundation is there you know why that wall is being built there. exactly well, cool. Um, yeah, thanks again so much. And uh, Ash and I are going to wrap things up, but we'll tell you how to get in touch with Rudy if you need your own permaculture design, because I think a lot of you might. All right, we hope that you found this interview with Rudy super useful. I know that we have learned so much from him and we're so passionate about sharing these concepts and ideas because we know that it will make a huge difference for off-grid homesteaders. As you know, we're just getting started here on our own property. So if you want to follow along, make sure you're subscribed. And if you need your own permaculture guide like we did, we can highly recommend Rudy. You can get in touch with him at waterslifedesign.com. We'll see you next time.